So, Markel Fultz has been traded to the Orlando Magic, which marks the end of his days as a Philadelphia 76er. And man, has this been a tumultuous two years. Not even two years, like 16 months, really. In today's video, I thought we'd go over these past 16 months for Markel Fultz and see how he went from the first overall pick to being eliminated from the process. This is the recap of the Markel Fultz saga. We begin on the morning of June 16th, 2017. The finals are over and all eyes are now turned towards the draft. The Celtics hold the first overall pick, the Lakers hold the second pick, and the Sixers hold the third pick. At this time, the Celtics had just come off a remarkable season where Isaiah Thomas had an all-NBA caliber year and led them to the Eastern Conference playoffs. With Jalen Brown and Al Horford on the roster and rumors of Gordon Hayward being a likely offseason acquisition, it seemed like they had their front court settled. So for fans and analysts alike, it made sense for them to draft a guard with the first overall pick. And for most people, the best guard, the best player in that draft was Markel Fotes out of the University of Washington. But that morning on June 16th, 2017, the Celtics traded down from the first pick to the third pick, receiving a future protected first round pick in return. For the Celtics, this was a somewhat confusing decision at the time, given that they already had or still had so many draft picks. The best explanation was that they didn't think Markel Fultz was as good a fit for their team as other prospects. And since Philadelphia wanted Fultz much more than they did, the extra first round pick they got in the trade was worth this trade down. For Philadelphia, this move was a clear indication that the Sixers had their eyes set on Markel Fultz. And six days later, they drafted Markel Fultz with the first overall pick, and the Celtics selected Jason Tatum with the third overall pick. Markel Fultz arrived at an exciting moment in Sixers history. After years of tanking under Emperor Sam Hinkie, the Sixers, after firing him, gave the fan base some life in the 2016 and 17 season. The team still went 28 and 54, but in the 31 games where Embiid played, they were 13 and 18. Embiid, in his first season of playing, had already demonstrated superstar talent and potential. Dario Saric had some moments as well, and with the Sixers' 2016 first overall pick, Ben Simmons, slated to come back from his injury that kept him out last season, Fultz formed a formidable young core in Philadelphia. Markel Fultz on paper seemed like a perfect fit with the Sixers. They had Embiid in the middle, Simmons as the pass-first playmaker, but lacked a go-to score on the perimeter, someone who could create his own shot off the dribble. And the most intriguing part about Fultz as a player was that he was a gifted shot creator. Many NBA scouts and college analysts said that he was one of the most polished offensive players they've ever seen at his age. In college, he averaged 23.2 points and did so with a variety of pull-up jumpers, drives to the basket, spin moves, and also demonstrated his athleticism with tough finishes and chase down blocks. In his summer league debut on July 3rd, Fultz missed a lot of shots but looked pretty smooth offensively and did end up scoring 17 points. His performance drew the attention of the reigning finals MVP, Kevin Durant, who commented on Fultz's dangerous, hezzy pull-up jimbo to use his term. While many NBA fans, including Sixers fans, still hated KD after seeing him win what some thought was an undeserved ring, Sixers fans could not help but be happy that Fultz had the stamp of approval from one of the best offensive players of all time. Six days later, Fultz suffered a lateral ankle sprain, which is usually a minor injury that keeps the player out one to two weeks. However, this sprained ankle would keep him out for the rest of Summer League. We then fast forward to September 28th, 2017, two days before the NBA preseason begins. During media day practice, head coach Brett Brown was asked about Markel Fultz, who hadn't seen the court since his ankle sprain. In what seemed like an offhanded comment at the time, Brown revealed that Fultz had been practicing with his personal trainer in the two months or so since Summer League ended, and that over these two months, Markel Fultz, quote, chose to look at some different things with his shot form. Later that day, Fultz was asked about this comment and he downplayed the changes, saying that he wanted to try something new, but stressing that his free throw is going to look the same as it did in college. Little did we know, these minor changes would eventually be the first domino in a tumultuous series of events, and that Markel Fultz's jump shot would be at the center of everything. Two days later, the NBA preseason begins, and immediately Sixers fans and reporters begin noticing that something is wrong with Markel Fultz. 
Nothing seems wrong physically. The sprained ankle two months earlier was not the problem. Fultz was running up and down the court and displayed the same level of quickness and burst that he had in college. The problem was that Markel Fultz wasn't taking jump shots. It wasn't that he was taking jump shots and missing them. No, he was not even attempting jump shots. Even in moments where he was left wide open for a spot up opportunity, or in moments where the defense gave him space for a pull up jumper in the paint, he refused to shoot. This was in stark contrast to his play style in college, where he looked for a shot at any given moment and would confidently take pull up jumpers from both three and from mid range. Articles started popping up describing these concerns, and soon the story of Fultz not shooting became a league wide NBA story. And in the NBA, when a story seeps into the national headlines, you can count on none other than Sir Woj the Bomber to jump on it. And that's exactly what he did. On October 24th, 2017, Wojnarowski, in a larger story about Markel Fultz, reports that the reason Fultz refuses to shoot is because it's physically painful for him to raise his arms. And the reason for that is because Fultz had a shoulder injury and as part of treatment, he had fluid drained out of his shoulder. Now in the NBA, it's not uncommon to hear athletes have fluid drained, although usually it's in the knee area. But the weird part is, why was Markel Fultz trying to play basketball when he couldn't even raise his arms? And why did the Sixers allow him to play in these preseason games under such conditions? Five days later, on October 29th, the Sixers in a press release confirmed that Fultz had what they called shoulder soreness and would miss the rest of the preseason because of it. At the time, there was no indication that he would miss significant time in the regular season, but he did. Fultz played in the first four games of the NBA season with a shoulder that was clearly still bothering him. After the fourth game, the Sixers announced that he was out indefinitely to rehab his shoulder, and he wouldn't return to the lineup until March 26th, 2018, missing nearly 70 games. From October 2017 to March of 2018, Fultz routinely traveled between Philadelphia and Lexington, Kentucky, where he was seeing an outside shoulder specialist. Outside in this case, meaning a doctor that is not affiliated with the Philadelphia 76ers. Just to clarify. About a month before his return in February of 2018, Sixers president Brian Colangelo revealed that Markel Fultz still could not shoot comfortably outside the paint, which was a crushing revelation for Sixers fans. Sixers reporter Kyle Newbeck put it best when he said that Markel Fultz went from a guard drawing comparisons to Kyrie Irving coming out of college to a six foot four Ben Simmons without the same size and athleticism to overcome the lack of shooting. The silver lining of the season came during the season finale where Markel Fultz became the youngest player to record a triple double. As he grabbed his 10th rebound, he was mobbed by teammates and received a standing ovation from the home crowd. However, Markel Fultz was essentially cut out of the rotation in the playoffs. He played only 23 minutes, most of which was garbage time, and given how he looked in his last 10 games or so in the regular season, nobody was arguing that he should have been playing at all. The second round of the playoffs was especially tough for Sixers fans, as they not only lost to the Boston Celtics in 5, but also had to watch Jason Tatum torch them for 23 points per game, the same guy that they gave up on to trade up to grab Markel Fultz. In the offseason of 2018, Markel Fultz started training with Drew Hanlon, who was a sort of celebrity NBA trainer. And Drew Hanlon made it no secret that he intended to transform Markel Fultz back into the number one overall pick that he was, even tweeting at Sixers fans to get excited. On a podcast over the summer, when asked what happened to Markel Fultz, Hanlon stated that Markel Fultz simply had the yips where he completely forgot how to shoot the basketball and had multiple hitches in his shots. And Hanlon's job was to get Markel Fultz back rolling. During the preseason on October 1st, on a fast break, Markel Fultz attempted a three-pointer and made it. And he hadn't made a three-pointer all of last year, so this was a pretty big deal. The season begins, and Markel Fultz is active and supposedly healthy, and he's starting too. But on November 4th, 2018, just 10 games into the season, he attempts an open three-pointer and misses horribly. And this video goes viral on Twitter. And as NBA Twitter does, people make fun of him and also his trainer, Drew Hanlon. Hanlon, in a reply to a tweet mocking him, pointed out that Fultz had still made progress and revealed that, at least in his opinion, Markel Fultz was still not healthy. He then quickly deleted this tweet, likely because he realized that Fultz not being healthy was not public knowledge at this time. 
However, the people in the Sixers organization did not share Hanlon's opinion. They believe Fultz to be healthy. And then a week later, on November 12th, we see another clip of Markel Fultz, and this time it went even more viral than his three-point miss. Markel Fultz trotted out a new free throw form, which included what seemed like a pump fake at the top of the release. One of the ugliest free throw attempts we've ever seen. That same day, November 12th, Reports come out that Markel Fultz and Drew Hanlon had a falling through and are no longer on speaking terms. And still, on that same day, as if you think things can't get crazy enough, the Sixers trade for Jimmy Butler. And oh my, NBA Twitter mercilessly memed Markel Fultz in anticipation of Jimmy Butler destroying whatever confidence remained in Markel. And in Jimmy Butler's first game with the Sixers, Markel Fultz was demoted to the bench. A day later, on November 13th, 2018, NBA insider Brandon Robinson reports that a motorcycle accident that happened in 2017 could be the root cause of all this chaos surrounding Markel Fultz. Two days later, Markel Fultz's agent Raymond Brothers was asked about the motorcycle incident, and Brothers adamantly denied the legitimacy of the report. Markel on the motorcycle, I saw the article that was sent, 100% not true, said Brothers. Quote me on that. With Butler now on the team, Fultz had even less of a role than he did before. And on November 19th, in a game against the Suns, Brett Brown benched him during the entire second half, and Fultz ended up playing a season low of just seven minutes. And literally 24 hours later, it was reported that Fultz had left the team and refused to practice until he was evaluated by another outsider shoulder specialist. And the timing on this made it seem like a weird decision. It seemed like this was not just about his shoulder, but also a little bit of spite against the Sixers organization or against Brett Brown for benching him the day before. This report was confirmed by Raymond Brothers, and Marco Fultz would then be out indefinitely again. And then... We fast forward to today. At the trade deadline, the Sixers traded Fultz to the Orlando Magic in exchange for Jonathan Simmons, a heavily protected first round pick and a second round pick. The trade didn't surprise anyone, or at least it shouldn't have. The Sixers, after trading for not only Jimmy Butler, but also Tobias Harris, are clearly accelerating the process and making a strong push for the Eastern Conference crown right now. Now, and more importantly, it seemed pretty obvious that the relationship between the Sixers organization and Markel Fultz and his team had deteriorated significantly. There was a clear lack of trust on both sides. And on paper, I like this Fultz trade for both teams. I think Philly got back a pretty good return because I didn't think Fultz had even that much trade value on the market, to be honest with you. And for Orlando, they are one of, they are one of the very few teams in the league that actually does not have a long-term answer at the point guard position. And they actually have the patience and the time to let Markel Fultz recover and then develop, seeing as they're not gonna be contending anytime soon. And for Fultz, if anything, a new star is exactly what he needed. Given that Philly is now in complete all-in win-now mode, Fultz's value to Philly basically diminished to zero. And even if he did see the court again, Sixers fans no longer have the patience to just watch him make mistakes on the court. Looking back at these past 16 months, the only word that can describe the situation is chaos. Despite the massive amount of reporting that has been done on the Markel Fultz saga, there's still a lot we don't know. We don't know exactly how Fultz's initial shoulder injury and treatment affected him. We don't know who or what prompted him to decide tinkering with his shot and his free throw. Between July and September of 2017, he wasn't practicing with the team. So who was he practicing with? Was this trainer, this outside trainer, the one who told him to modify his shot? What about his trainer a year later, Drew Hanlon? What happened between them that caused an irreparable rift? How much responsibility should be placed on the Sixers medical staff who already have an iffy history with how they've handled Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons? What role did Markel Fultz's agent and attorney Raymond Brothers play in all of this? What about Philadelphia's decision to trade for Jimmy Butler? What about the media? If this happened 20 years ago when there was a lot less coverage of off the court drama, would this turn out differently? What about the fans? Did all the attention and pressure we place on Markel Fultz make the situation worse? There are so many parties involved in the Markel Fultz saga that the only way to describe it is again, chaos. 
As for Marco Fultz, I wish him the best. In terms of him as a basketball player, I am intrigued by some flashes of ball handling and driving ability and creativity that show you why he was considered the number one overall pick. In terms of him as a person, he hasn't done anything that I know of off the court that would make me root against him, and I do feel some sympathy for him. I'm 20 years old, Marco Fultz is also 20 years old, we're both born in 1998, as weird as it is to think that we're the same age, but I can't imagine, like at 19 years old, you have millions of fans around the world talking about you, and sure, a lot of them are supportive, but there's also a lot of people out there, critics, who are questioning stuff like your mental toughness, and everywhere you go, reporters are always asking questions. I mean, they're just doing their job, but the NBA, which is essentially an, in, it's in the entertainment business. The NBA is a form of entertainment, as we often forget. In the entertainment business, a reporter doing their job does often, unfortunately, pry into someone's personal life. So yeah, I do feel kind of bad for the guy. Although, I don't feel that bad for the guy. You know what I mean? I mean, he is making $10 million per year while I'm stuck in college making this, making YouTube videos, hoping for a, a $1 CPM. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who's getting who? I'd be willing to remove my entire shoulder if it means I get to make $10 million per year. <laughs> That's real talk. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this recap video. If you have any thoughts, leave them in the comments. You can hit me up on Twitter or Instagram. And in the meantime, check out my second channel. That's right. I do have a second channel in case you didn't know. It's a second channel where I do comedy skits and uh, just general commentary stuff. So go check that out if you have the time. My name is Mark Jane, and one day I'll be a one-armed millionaire. Peace.